Welcome to the Audiobook Readers Review, a space for writers, audiobook narrators, producers and listeners, of course, to discuss everything audiobooks. Today, we're talking with Landon Beach, author of the new psychological thriller, Narrator, which features, you guessed it, an audiobook narrator in the lead role. Landon was born and raised in Michigan, but now lives in the Sunshine State with his wife, two children, and their golden retriever. He previously served as a naval officer and was an educator for 15 years before becoming a full-time writer. He is the award-winning author of Huron Breeze, as well as numerous other books, including those of The Great Lakes Saga. Let's hear what he has to say about writing, audiobooks, and writing about audiobooks. I'm delighted today to have Landon Beach here. He is the author of a new psychological thriller called Narrator. Um, and we're going to hear all about that book today and what inspired him to write it uh, and what it's about, although we probably won't give you the ending because that would be a terrible spoiler. Um, so welcome, Landon. Oh, lovely to be with you, Sarah. Thank you for having me on. Excellent. It's a pleasure. Um, tell me about this book, Narrator. What is it and how did the concept kind of bubble up and, and become this book? Sure. So I had been thinking for about 20 years about writing a book that took place in the entertainment industry, but I could never quite figure out how to do it because so much has been done with authors and playwrights and disc jockeys and film directors. They've all been put through the ringer, shall we say. And I could never find anything that I thought would be fresh and original and something that the audience hadn't seen before. But I studied film in college and my degree is in screenwriting. So I've been looking at film all my life in addition to writing. And four films were kind of foundational in this quest to write this mythical book about the entertainment industry, you know, in the framework of a psychological thriller. And that was Vertigo, Play Misty for Me, Misery, and a beautiful mind. And I used to be an educator before I became a full-time writer. And a short story that I used to assign to my students was The Continuity of Parks by Julio Cortazar. So if you think of it, I kind of had these five works in a soup in my brain, and I kept stirring and stirring. And finally, after I had written my third book, I felt that I was in a position that I had built my resume up enough to expand my business and hire an audiobook narrator to perform them. And I was very fortunate to make the contact uh, and become friends with Scott Brick. And Scott and I had a very traditional agreement for the first three books, which is what most authors and narrators have, where you send the manuscripts off and voila, <laughs> after a couple months, you hear the finished product and then it goes out into the marketplace and, and you're off and running. But after that, we had a few Zoom calls like you and I are doing right now and we became friends. And as we became friends and I learned more about the business, it came to me that, oh, I finally got it. I don't think anyone has written a novel with an audiobook narrator as the main character in the framework of a psychological thriller. And then everything came together in a big rush. I thought of those four movies. I thought of that short story. And I thought of my main character who, as you know, from reading it uh, ends up being Sean Frost. And so then I went about spending maybe 12 to 18 months of researching everything about voiceover and audiobook narrators, because what it ended up being, Sarah, is a love letter from me to storytelling and to storytellers. And I wanted to make sure that the research was impeccable and that there's wide appeal for 99% of the fans that don't know anything about audiobooks other than they love to listen to them. And the audiobook narrators are so good that they make it seem easy. Like, oh, you know, anybody can do this. And of course, in my research, I found out just how difficult it is and what an art and science it yeah. is. 
And so I came to have a tremendous amount of respect for the work that Scott does and other audiobook narrators such as yourself that I had no clue about before. And so that would be kind of the genesis of the idea and how it came together. And then kind of the hook for narrator would be as follows. <laughs> You've got Sean Frost, who is the main character, and he is a performing arts prodigy. <laughs> he was a two-time Tony Award winner in his 20s who goes to the apex of the theater world as an actor and a playwright. But as he starts to get accustomed to that fast lifestyle and all of the accolades that you know are, are placed upon him, mm. um, his faults also rise. And safe to say something horribly, horribly goes wrong in his life. And he almost dies and he has to travel cross country to get out of New York City. And he goes all the way to California to Carmel by the Sea. But he's a performer. He loves performing arts and he doesn't want to get totally away from that. So he reinvents himself as an audiobook narrator and he discovers that he's pretty good. And as his talent starts to really grow and flourish, his faults start to come back again. And then maybe he is kidnapped by two <laughs> obsessed fans who want to make Sean read their book. And it takes off from there. Yes, it sure does. Um, that's a really fascinating genesis of a story. I love that you've got, you know, these these influential movies and stories ticking away in your mind and then you've got your relationship with Scott Brick um, and that and it all just comes together and I can I can see that that must have generated a lot of energy for you in in the writing of the story it did I I, I spent a lot of time in in Sean's head <laughs> and it's funny now you know three months after the book has come out um and I say it a little bit tongue in cheek, but also not as, you know, you're a, you're a writer yourself and you get so involved in it. I, I do miss writing about the guy. He's like a, he's like a friend that's left me. <laughs> Did you, I mean, you're writing, your book is called Narrator. Your protagonist is an audiobook narrator. Um, your kind of world is, is the world of audiobook narration. It's the booth. Um, it's the process. Did you write this story with the audio version in mind? And did that affect the way that you wrote? Like, did you write differently imagining the audio book of your story? That's a fantastic question, Sarah. And I get asked that in different ways um, throughout the interviews that I've been on because before I started working with Scott, I wrote really traditionally in terms of not thinking about my book being performed at all. And I'm kind of old school in how I approach my dialogue tags, where I like to use very boring tags like he said and she said yeah. throughout, because what it does is it makes the words in the dialogue inside the quotation marks do the work. They yeah. have to carry the weight and the emphasis. Um, and so what I realized after I heard Scott um, perform my first three books was that I said, he said, she said a lot uh, as there were dialogue exchanges and it did interrupt the, the listen. Mm -hmm. I, I said, wow, you know, because when you're reading a book, you and I and other readers, we just throw those away. Yep. You know, you don't even know that they're there. Yep. But when you have a performer reading them, I said, wow, uh, it's it's completely correct, but I think that I can do better here. So after that third book, when I wrote my fourth, fifth, and sixth one, because I've worked with Scott on all six of my books, I did think of them, and I think it made me a better writer. And mm -hmm. I added one edit into the end of my writing process, which is I would read the story aloud to myself, and I would say, do I really need that dialogue tag? You know, have I established the point of view character enough by what I've written for the dialogue for a particular character? Could the audience figure out who it is? And so that would be one answer would be yes. In that way, I've definitely altered how I write books 
because I think of the audiobook in mind all the time. And the other part is kind of the fun part of the answer, which was, you know, this particular audiobook, this book, yes, it was like the Kindle and the paperback. I think it's a fun, exciting read. And a lot of people that have read the book already have said that they enjoy it in that format. But yes, it was made to be performed and listened to because of Scott's skill and the way he brings Sean to life. Um, when I was writing, I said, ooh, I can't wait until I hear him perform, you know, this part. It was always front and center. Yes. That's a really interesting hybrid then between screenwriting um, and traditional, more traditional narrative writing, isn't it? It's thinking about what will keep the audience engaged and that doesn't take them out of the read, but it also doesn't take them out of the listen. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I had not anticipated before when I was just writing for print. And then when audiobooks uh, came along, it did change the way that I thought about them. And two, from a performing arts standpoint and being a screenwriter, of course, I would love to see this made into a film. I think it would be fantastic. I think it would be a blast, you know, a, a great time at the at the theater to watch this. And that was always in the back of my mind a little bit, too, of this would translate really well to the screen. Now, I want to know, because reading this book, I was like, I think I'm going to feel a little bit edgy when I go sit in the booth next time and start recording my next book. And I was just imagining Scott sitting there narrating this book where there are some quite suspenseful, um, dangerous, engaging scenes that involve being in a booth and narrating. And I was wondering how was Scott feeling while he was, you know, sitting there doing this? Was he looking over his shoulder? And so did, did he mention anything about that to you? Have you guys talked about that? Yes, we we've talked about it uh, about it many times. You know, the the first part of it is this, and which is funny because I'm going to make fun of myself as as an author. It gets so lonely, Sarah, in this room all day just <laughs> writing. And so, you know, when you're writing a book, let's say about being an author, I mean, it's it's next to impossible to be like oh, he picked up the pencil and the paper. Ooh, <laughs> you you can't really make that dramatic, and so. Right. I had to go with first person present tense so mm -hmm. that we were in Sean's mind a lot. And I and I thought I can make the booth exciting if it's a psychological thriller told from Sean's point of view. Mm -hmm. I think that was the only way that, that I could do it. But yes, there are some crazy things that happen in the booth. And I've had some people who have listened to it write me emails and they're like, you know, Landon, is Scott okay? <laughs> and so I play with them. I write back, I go, Scott's fine, I assure you, ellipses. <laughs> but no, he he told me, he says, you know, I've got to tell you, a couple times I went in the booth after, you know, performing parts of your book, and I'm like, oh, gosh, I, I don't want to spoil what happens in the book, but he would say, and I thought about this, and yeah. then I turned around and I thought about that. <laughs> So it was uh, it was it was fun all all around. But oh. Scott Scott's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I assure you. Dot dot dot. <laughs> I assure you. Oh, <laughs> uh, now we've talked a bit about writing strategy. I want to talk a little bit more about that um, because something I noticed that I thought was very clever is that because you're talking about a narrator who is. Um, working with stories, you've actually been able to embed secondary stories into your story. Um, so the narrator, you know, Sean, early in the book has been working with this particular um, project and you've basically got a synopsis of a book that he's been working through. And I thought what you've been able to do there is actually introduce the sort of tension buildup that you get towards the end of a book into the early stages of your book. And that's quite clever in terms of a hook for readers uh, that keeps them turning pages. Was that was that an intentional strategy or did it sort of just fall out that way and you went, oh, that works well? It was intentional in the beginning because talking with Scott and listening and learning from other narrators, when you're in the booth for 12, 14 hours narrating a book, there is a certain level of energy 
that takes place when you finally get to the climax and you know almost you can see yourself clapping in the booth and cheering like yay i'm finally here it's time for the payoff and so what i wanted to do was i thought wouldn't it be neat to start off the book right at the climax where the tension is high and then have something happen in the book that is a beloved series. And I think every narrator, they love certain series and they can't wait, you know, until they get the next book in that series because they love the characters as, as much mm -hmm. as the authors do. And what if something happened like it does to Sean, where you had no idea this was coming and it throws your whole world into a tailspin. So it kind of had two purposes in that way, which was to take us right in the booth with a narrator. So we feel like we're right by their side and seeing how they get into that final part. And then just to be shocked and say, how's this guy going to recover from this? <laughs> That's right. Because it's it's on the first page, isn't it? Where he's sitting there with tears streaming down his face. He can't believe it. He yeah. cannot believe it. <laughs> and he's so embedded in the story, which is what happens when you narrate a, a story and you're right, right inside it. Right. Um, and then later in the book, as you know, there are other stories that he is not fond of narrating and he's just dragging himself through. So we wanted to show that as well. <laughs> yeah, well, that is also relatable. <laughs> um, so you, your book has a, an impressive array of um, commendations at the beginning. Uh, what's been the response to this book? Obviously, it's something that real life audiobook narrators in particular can get excited about because, you know, they are the protagonist. <laughs> so it, it has been Sarah just a dream so far the people that are just reading it for a psychological thriller you know land and beach take me away from my life for you know a few hours to get some escapism and entertainment it has totally worked on that level and I've had a lot of them come to me saying at three or four different points, I thought I had it figured out what was going on. And I didn't with the big twist at the end. So that always makes me feel like, wow, I've done my job mm -hmm. as, you know, as a writer. Um, and then there have been people in the entire voiceover community that have reached out and talked to me and said, you know, finally, a book for us, but yet it's entertaining, but they feel they feel the love and they feel valued. And also too, I mean, a lot of us too, I can say this as an author, there's people, friends and relatives that are like, hey, when are you going to get a real job? <laughs> and, and so what So what I thought would be neat about this book, and it is working on this level too, is that people in the voiceover industry are able to say to those friends and family now and say, hey, would you like to know a little bit about what I do and all that it takes to bring a book from the manuscript level to the point where the consumer's listening through a psychological thriller that's going to entertain you? And they can say, here, listen or read narrator. And so that's been a fun way to make some inroads and to have some people appreciate narrators and people in the voiceover industry more than they did before. And I'm really happy about that because I know I do I, with how ignorant I was about the whole process before I started researching. Yeah. Well, I did, you know, reading it, I was like, it, it was very convincing to me in terms of your um, consciousness of the narrating process and how it works. And, and, you know, you've sort of got cleverly placed smatterings in there of, technical stuff which doesn't come across as technical in the narrative it sort of all just fits together but it's like oh you wouldn't know that unless you were either a narrator or you knew about the process uh, quite closely so I thought it was really well done um you know you could do it really poorly <laughs> easily where you could make it sound like a wikipedia page uh -huh. but to make to dramatize it and make it feel like it's not information dumps that was one of the one of the big challenges because you know I, I can't remember. There have been so many fantasy series and military thrillers where somebody explains a gun for like three quarters of a page. and You're just like, oh, my gosh. Or someone in a fantasy novel talks about a tree for three pages. It's like, I, I get it. It's a tree. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Well, I feel like, you know, talking about your book is really perfect fit for the, the podcast because the whole idea is that it's bringing together, you know, writers and narrators and listeners to actually I don't know, get embedded in the process of what it means to bring a story to life 
um, in different ways, whether that's writing it and then, of course, the the narrating it and then the listening to it and the interpreting of it. Um, so I feel like, oh, yeah, this is a perfect fit. Um now I'm also wondering whether or not you've thought about turning your hand or your voice to narrating yourself now that you've uh, you've done all this research into it. I could, but I think that would be a really bad mistake. <laughs> <laughs> but here's you know, here's my take on it: is in short periods, um, I really like reading. I read aloud to my class when I taught Shakespeare um, and, and so forth. I, re I read aloud to my kids, you know, for bedtime stories and whatnot. And I like that. But as part of the research for this book, I said, well, let's, let's give it a shot here. Just, I wanted to know what it felt like. Mm -hmm. And so I took a book and I was in a room all by myself. And I said, I'm, okay, I'm going to try to be like an audiobook narrator here. And Sarah, I got 10 or 15 minutes into it and I was gassed. I was like, <laughs> oh my gosh, this is difficult. I'm like, water, water, please. <laughs> so it it would be interesting and I think that it could be fun, but I'm not sure that, you know, that would be kind of a something that I would find, you know, I could make a, a career of, mostly because I found out how difficult it is and how much we take it for granted what narrators do. I mean, kudos to you and everyone. I, every chance I get now, I, I thank narrators for the the art form that they have mastered and continue to just, I, I'm in awe of it, really. So, yes, I was a failed narrator for 15 minutes <laughs> in <laughs> well, my research. <laughs> I feel like you can you can give yourself a break because just like anything, you know, like learning to run a marathon, not that I've learned to run a marathon, you know, working up to like, you know, a couple of K run, um, like right. anything, you know, what feels like a huge amount at the start, what's really exhausting, you gradually build up your resilience and your capacity um, over time uh, to be able to to do that. But, you know, it's it takes time and I guess there has to be the the end goal or the motivation to reach that goal for a particular purpose. And if you've got, you know, if you love right. writing and you've right. got great narrators narrating your work and you love what they're doing, then you go, all right, yep, I'm the writer. You're, you're the narrator, go and do your thing. And, and it's a great collaboration. And there's something really exciting about that collaboration too, because then the narrator's bringing something fresh to your story. Um, do you find that you hear your story in a new way when you hear someone else narrate it? I do. And here's an example of things that I wouldn't have picked up on before, but having worked with Scott and gone through the process of writing this particular book, now I'm much more aware of the decisions that he makes uh, in his performance for you know a paragraph here, a sentence here, a word here, just the way that you know he'll emphasize and you know he's fond of saying subtlety plays in audiobook narrating. Yeah. And I think that that is very true um when listening to a book being performed especially by him and something that i look forward to because it is like experiencing it it's his interpretation as well and he wants to make my vision come alive of course mm -hmm. but you know he's owning the performance of sean frost and and one thing that i loved about this particular book is he is just incredible at reading first person narration like mm. i mean he's great at third person close third person omniscient but getting inside a character's head it's like he puts you in a trance and you know pretty soon you know if you identify with a character you know you think oh i'm sean frost wait a minute no i'm just <laughs> listening about sean frost <laughs> it, it is it's totally different listening to him perform it this this one's not quite your lie in bed and fall asleep listen is it like <laughs> you go into the trance but <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's going to keep you awake, um, possibly even after you've stopped listening to it, but, you know. I might think about it a little bit afterwards. Yeah, that's right, that's right, which is a good thing, you know, the echoes of the story that stay with you. Now let's talk about writing because I'm interested in that too. You've talked a bit about your background studying film and screenwriting uh, and also teaching and teaching Shakespeare and you're a full-time writer now. Your books are indie published. Can you tell me a bit about how you ended up becoming a full-time writer and how you're finding it and whether you've got advice to other people kind of thinking about developing their writing? 
yeah, I'd be happy to share what I've gone through. And if it, it helps somebody, uh, wonderful. Um, so I had written a novel 20 years ago or so, and I had done the traditional query process and um, I wrote another novel and queried and it was good and bad. The good was the agents and editors who had looked at the novel said, we really like your writing. This is good stuff. Mm -hmm. But they said, we just can't sell this. Mm -hmm. And it was really frustrating to go through that. And a little bit about what I write. Narrator is kind of on its own little island. <laughs> but I do write standalone novels. All of my books are standalones. But they do have a common thread with where I was born and raised, which is around the Great Lakes area. Um, and I'm from Michigan. And I don't know, I, I don't say I took it personally, but, you know, I never thought that that area got much love in the area of fiction. And I grew up thinking this is such a wonderful place to set stories and all of the adventures and thrills and suspense that could be here. And so I wrote books about that. And I, I'm i writing a Great Lakes saga where there's five Great Lakes and I set one book on or around each Great Lake. And so I've done that for four Great Lakes, but they're mixed genres. A couple of them are treasure hunting mysteries. Um, one is piracy and or, an organized crime thriller and, and an, an espionage thriller. And But they're all kind of have the same common thread is that they're on the Great Lakes. And I got to the point where I had a book and I I was really frustrated because I was hearing the same thing over and over again. And I said, well, I wonder if there's any basis in this. And my wife read one of my books and she said, this is good. She said, you may not know this, but the publishing world is changing before your eyes. And it, she, she told me, either you're going to put this book out on Amazon <laughs> or I'm going to do it behind your back <laughs> and see how it does. And I said, okay, we will give it a shot. And we put it out there and a lot of people started buying it and really enjoying it. And then I didn't do this out of validation, but I was still curious to see, well, how do other people that write this sort of fiction, how do they receive it? Mm. So I entered it in an international writing contest called the Clive Custler Adventure Writing Competition. And Clive Custler, of course, is a legend. He's known around the world. He's kind of the grandmaster of adventure. And I put that book, which was The Wreck, there. And I ended up being a semifinalist. I made the top 10. Wow. And I said, hey, okay. I, I looked at my wife and I said, okay, you might be onto something here. Let's see how this goes. So I wrote another one and the second book was called The Sale and it was set on a different Great Lake. And I made the top three in the Clive wow. Custer Adventure Competition. I was a finalist. And so we got to fly out to Phoenix, Arizona, which is a long way away from where I'm at in Florida right now and go through the ceremony and everything that went along with being a finalist. And then I wrote a book called The Cabin and it was at that point point where I said, you know, these are selling well. It wasn't enough to where I could stop teaching and become a full-time writer at that point, but it got me to the point where I could afford audiobooks. Yep. Yep. And that's when I reached out to Scott and his wonderful production manager, Gina. And once those audiobooks came out, and then I wrote the next book called The Hike, which is the organized crime thriller. It's kind of breaking bad meets the Godfather. That's what I like to say. <laughs> Um, and then I was ready to write the fifth one and things are still going well. And I'm seeing this happen before my eyes, which I never saw coming. Of course, wife was right again. <laughs> and one of my friends in the publishing industry challenged me and said, you know, I, he goes, I'll, can you write a mystery? I'll bet you can't write a murder mystery. Just do it. Because you and I both know that mysteries and romance are the two best-selling genres. Those sell, they always sell. There's never a down year for mysteries yeah. or romance novels. So I said, okay, I'll try it. And so I wrote one and 
put it into a contest. And it's funny that we're on this podcast right now. A couple of days ago, I just got notified that it won the mystery of the year for 2022. What? Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. I'm like, what the heck? The, I'm like, go figure the one that I wrote on a whim, right? <laughs> so I ended up turning that into a trilogy because some fans had said, we would love to know more about these characters that you wrote. And so I'm writing two more in that series. And I've got one, the sequel is just about to come out in a month on December 22nd for the holiday season. So what I, that's kind of been my journey. And then narrator was kind of that moonshot that it was so clear in my mind once I got the idea with Scott, I kind of pushed all the other works to the side and I just had to write that and get that out there. So again, that one's just a little bit different, even though it's a, a standalone. So what I would say, you know, Sarah, for aspiring writers is, oh my gosh, don't give up. Mm. Do not give up. And it just is going to take time. There is still a ton of luck involved yeah, But there are more opportunities now for writers to get their work out there. And that's not to say that if a traditional publisher came to me and wanted to talk uh, about possibly a partnership, of course I'd listen. I think that'd be great. I still don't have anything against that. Mm -hmm. But being able to go down this road and four years after I put out my first work to be able to be doing it full time right now, uh, has just been a, a blessing. And mm -hmm. I, I pinch myself sometimes wondering, is this happening? But yes, there are, you know, put your work out there, give it a shot, enter contests, build your resume mm -hmm. and, and see what happens. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm glad, I'm glad that I didn't give up. So it was 19 years, 19 years from when I wrote that first book, Mm -hmm. till the day that I finally was able to do it full time. And that's a long time to wait, mm -hmm. 19 years. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a great story. And it's great to be reminded of, um, I guess, both the work involved, but also the fact that it does actually lead somewhere. You can't necessarily predict where or how it's going to get right. you to. But um, the consistency of just coming back and, and pushing on, uh, and giving it to people to read who are going to believe in you, you know, and give you, you know, give you genuine feedback and honest responses to the work, but help you go, oh, hang on a minute, like maybe it's worth pursuing. Because as a writer, you're not, I mean, we write for our own pleasure, yes, but it's like the yin and yang, like the, the readers are the other half of the, the equation. It's very yeah. competitive. You know, we don't want to not mention that because it is yeah. it is yeah. it is still very difficult and treacherous waters to navigate yeah. but i will say this what i've discovered which is to your point the readers are out there yeah. and they're hungry for fiction they're they're hungry for stories and so the one thing that i would say and this is probably the best piece of advice i could give uh, you know in addition to not giving up and trusting yourself and believing yourself that you're enough, that you are enough, you, you can do this, is make sure what you put out is your best work. Yeah. Because yeah. there's also, you know, a fallacy out there that is, oh, well, just write as fast as you can, put as many books out as you can. Mm -hmm. And, you know, authors putting books out every 30 days, you know, quote, books. <laughs> You know, you know, my rule number one, of course, is thou shalt not speak ill of another author. <laughs> if that works for you, Godspeed, go for it. But I'm going to say this, that there are a lot of people that see it as a quick way to become successful and make money. And mm -hmm. for every one person that is able to do that, there are hundreds of thousands that try it and feel, oh, my gosh, why did I waste my time putting yeah. out garbage so make sure that what you put out is the absolute best thing that you can. And that's what I've always tried to do with mine is, do I believe in this book? Does mm. it have a beginning, a middle and an end? <laughs> and, 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 and be happy with, with that so that you don't look back and say, I, I rushed that one yeah. because yeah. it's difficult to go back. That That's something that a, a lot of people that have gone into self-publishing they get really frustrated with it because they said, I don't get it. I, I followed the formula. I wrote six books in six months and I'm losing money on Amazon. You know, 
there's it, it, it's not easy. No. Well, I mean, it's like narrating, isn't it? Once you you get in there and you go, I'm going to do a really good job of this, you realize there are so many more layers to the process. There's so much more subtlety. There are so many more, you know, dimensions of skill that are involved. Um, uh, I don't say that as someone who, you know, purports to have mastered any of them. I think, in fact, that's part of the joy of it is that there are things we do that we keep learning and growing our entire lives doing them. Um, there's no end point. There's no, okay, you've done it. You've achieved it. You're a writer now. Um, you can stop because we don't want to stop. <laughs> we want to keep growing and getting better and finding new stories. And it's the same with narrating, but you know, to really put a story out there, that's your blood, sweat and tears have gone into it. It just takes a lot of time and a lot of work, particularly if you are, um, managing the process yourself as an indie publisher slash writer, you know, you haven't, like we talked about earlier before I was recording, you haven't got a team of people working on your work unless you go out and source, you know, all the different people. Right. And when, and when you do that, then you have to pay them. And then exactly. it becomes even more difficult because your works are going to be price less than traditionally published works. And so yeah. in order to make that bottom line, um, the more that you can do by yourself and that's, you know, editing yeah. and being your own publicist and learning how to actually run and make your own Amazon ads. And not yeah. everyone can do that. I, my, my wife has been, you know, a godsend on that. Uh, she's really good at figuring out ads. Um, and so that, you know, you don't spend a ton of money um, and then make 15 cents. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you want to be able to have a good profit margin and a good conversion rate and that yeah. takes time too so that would be another piece of advice I guess in hindsight is it won't happen overnight to 99.999 yeah. percent yes there's probably going to be some book someday that just takes off and run and we'll all look at it and smile <laughs> but you know for everyone else usually it's not until book three or four where you start seeing any kind of a profit yeah, yeah. And I guess, too, it makes me think about um, our goals or our measures of success, you know, as writers, as narrators, too, because, um, you know, similarly, your portfolio sort of build up in a similar way. But I sometimes feel that if, as a writer, my my a particular book connects with a small cohort of people, but it really makes a difference or it really connects with that group of people um then in a way I've achieved what I wanted to achieve as a writer I mean I recognize I'm saying that you know within the framework of having a roof over my head and having food on the table and all those sorts of things you know obviously traditional publishers their businesses they have to operate you know thinking about success as um, profit to some degree but this story of of people being told this is great writing I love your story but it's not going to sell is just so common. And what, what your story actually shows us is, well, there are people who buy the stories and yeah. do we aim to go for world domination or do we aim I for... I say it to be, you know, a jerk or anything, but that is one thing after four years I can unequivocally say is that they were all 100% wrong. Yeah. You know, my, yeah. My, yeah. My, my books do sell. If they didn't, I wouldn't be doing this full time right now. Yeah. Yeah. And so, but again, anytime, Sarah, that you put art and money in the same sentence, it's a yeah. strange combination and it's hard yeah. to kind of reconcile those, those two things together. But yeah, it's a, it's just a, it's an interesting, it's an interesting in world for sure one that will make sense one day and the next day yeah. you will say none of this makes any sense yeah. at all yeah it's very tangled isn't it and you know I like to not shy away from these complexities because absolutely writers are often not paid what they really deserve to be paid and what they should be paid and there are not a lot of opportunities for people to write uh full-time and to pursue that unless it's something like copywriting or something like that on the other hand, like you say, you know, putting money and art together in, in the same sentence automatically gets really tricky. And, and, you know, the questions of how we measure success and what our goals are uh, as writers and performers 
you know, like they're, they're important questions to keep reflecting on. And for me, I, I have no desire to quote, you know, live large. I, to be able to write full time and to devote time to my craft and my art and enjoy time with my family, you know, that is what gives me satisfaction in, in, in my work. I've always gone into it where, if I made enough to be able to do it and for us to live comfortably, then that was good enough for me. Anything else beyond that, you know, would be wonderful, but, but not expected. And like you said, for this book in particular, for me, what meant the most to me was when people that were in the industry appreciated the book and enjoyed it and felt, you know, that I had written something that was about their area of expertise that had paid them a lot of respect and that they got a kick out of it. But to, you know, for a writer and, you know, like yourself as a performer, when you get that kind of feedback, Mm -hmm. that's that intrinsic, you know, kind of motivation and and satisfaction that, Mm -hmm. you know, money can never touch. Mm -hmm. Yep. Absolutely. (laughs) But it doesn't hurt. No, it doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt. Yeah. Well, um, it's been a pleasure to talk with you, Landon. Is there anything else that you want to to share with listeners before we sign off? Well, if they are interested in Narrator or any of uh, my books, you can go to my website, which is landonbeachbooks.com. And the Kindle version and the paperback version are on it. Amazon, the Kindle exclusively, but the paperback you can find at other stores as well. But my audiobooks are wide. So wherever audiobooks are sold, you can get narrator and the rest for in 30 seconds. So that would be the one thing is if you're interested in them, um, I hope you enjoy them. Um, but no, it's, it's just been an absolute pleasure getting to know you and, and talk to you today and exchange ideas and just to meet someone new that this is something i i love too as artists and creative folk we need this it's rejuvenating yeah. you know yeah. it's nourishing because a lot of what we do is in isolation so i feel like i'm talking to my my friend across the ocean here <laughs> the friend across the ocean in your tomorrow <laughs> right i know you're living where i'm headed tomorrow yeah that's it i can't tell you much about it really because uh well, the sun's out, but who knows what it's going to be like where you are. It's yeah, windy. yeah. And the sun came up, so that's a good thing. That's a good start. That's it. The world keeps turning. That's the important part. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's just been lovely to talk with you, Sarah. Thanks for listening to the Audiobook Reader's Review. If you're an author looking to have your work narrated, reach out to Voices of Today via our website, to help with your production and distribution needs. We're especially keen to work with Australian authors who don't have access to the ACX platform. And if you're looking for your next audiobook listen, check out some of Voices of Today's latest titles. The History of the Devil and the Idea of Evil by Paul Karras, narrated by Dennis Daly, and now available for pre-order on Audible. The Life of Mary Baker Eddy by Sybil Wilbur, narrated by Christiane Lufer, now on Audible, and The Trespasser by D. H. Lawrence, narrated by Patrick Barker, available where all good audiobooks are sold. This has been the Audiobook Reader's Review, produced by Voices of Today and hosted by Sarah Bakula. Tune in next time for another great interview. If you want to get in contact with us, you can visit voicesoftoday.org forward slash contact. Thanks for listening.